Welcome to a special edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. On today's broadcast, in celebration of Black History Month, Andrew is joined by David and Tim Barton as they discuss the numerous black heroes of America. History is a lot more diverse than we realize. It's just that we don't know the stories yeah. and the diversity of our history. See, we, we give dates, names, and places today. We don't give stories yeah. and people. We don't tell the stories. And now, here's Andrew. Today, I'm continuing interviewing David Barton and Tim Barton, and we've been talking about heroes, black heroes in American history. Most people haven't heard these things. I never have. I tell you, this has been blessing me and inspiring me. You are going to be blessed. So stay tuned as I interview David and Tim Barton on today's Gospel Truth. Am I correct in saying that Douglas at one time believed that all the Founding Fathers were prejudiced? And yes. as he studied their things, he, he was completely converted correct. by reading their own writings. He, he was taught that the Constitution is a slave document. The slaves were only worth three-fifths of a person in the Constitution. He, he was taught all the bad stuff, and he believed that. Um, uh, uh, one of the famous abolitionists, radical abolitionists, taught him that. And then he got hired full-time to go on the road and speak anti-slavery, Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And he said, you know, at that time, I decided I better know what I'm talking about, so I read the Constitution. He said, when I read it, he said, contrary to what I'd been taught, he said, it was a glorious liberty document. He said, every line in it was a liberty. And he, he goes on, and the three-fifths thing, the way we portray today is totally wrong. Go back to Frederick Douglass. And, uh, and there's me, just so much Let there. me just say that I know that most people may know who Frederick Douglass is, but not everybody, since we have such a shortage on American sure. history. Who is Frederick Douglass? Frederick? Oh, we have there an we image go. of him. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so, so we do. We, I mean, we have an entire stack of these guys. We do want to get to. So let me find Fred, Frederick Douglass real quick. Frederick Robert Douglass Smalls. was born in slavery, escaped slavery, actually beat up his master, got out of slavery, uh, came to the North, started telling this story, told it first in New York, New York uh, anti-slavery. There's Frederick Douglass. He's the most photographed man in the 1800s. No one is more photographed than he was. He wrote three different autobiographies. He wrote the same autobiography, but he kept updating it every 20 years, and so you got more and more about him. So he's a huge guy. He was appointed by four presidents um, at, for political office. He was removed by one president, um, but it's just just a wonderful guy. But he was a, a pro. He was a slave. He beat up his master, escaped, went to New York, started speaking against slavery. Then he was, and that's where he was discipled about the Constitution by guys who thought the Constitution is terrible. Then he was hired by the Massachusetts uh, Anti-Slavery Society, and that's where we know him after that. He was such a leader. He consulted with Abraham Lincoln on the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, he worked 13th Amendment. He actually recruited, recruited the first two black regiments in the Civil War, the Mass 54th. Two of his sons served in Mass 54th. That's the movie Glory. So he, he's, a, he's a big figure. He's a big time guy. So he, he's a lot of fun, but he... But he, he credits Jefferson with coming up with this line that again, Every abolitionist pointed to the notion that we are all created equal. In fact, even Martin Luther King Jr., right, in the middle of all of the, the civil rights issues going on in America, pointed back and said, Thomas Jefferson and the Declaration, right, says all men are created equal. So this is one of those moments that, again, we can look at people and say, you know what, they weren't perfect and, and, and they made some mistakes, but to take away from the fact that God uses imperfect people, and, and what happened was still significant. And even so many of, of the heroes that we celebrate, and actually we'll go through this whole stack in a minute, but as we learn their stories, a lot of their stories came because of the foundation laid by the founding fathers that led to slavery ending every Northern state after the declaration, every Northern state starts passing anti-slavery laws. Once we, we got free from Great Britain, we could make forward progress yeah. on it. Well, I think that most people can understand that God uses imperfect people because we all are imperfect ourselves and stuff. But uh, there is a prejudice against the founding fathers that because sure. they had slaves, they weren't only used in spite of themselves, that they were evil people. And uh, so you've addressed the fact that they couldn't just free their slaves and stuff like that. And by the this. way, a lot depending of them... Depending on the state, because some of them did free their slaves. And a lot of them never even owned slaves. John Adams and Sam Adams and guys like that never owned a slave and were huge anti-slavery guys. All right, but I, I, and I know the answer to this, but I want to bring this up and give you an opportunity. I had a person again uh, criticize me over a statement with Jefferson saying, well, Jefferson would sit there and rape Sally Hemming as she was chained to the wall. And how could you say that this is a godly man? Okay. 
So the, the thing we try to point out, during the summer we work with young people a lot, um, a lot of college kids. And so on college campuses, there's so many of these accusations. And what we talk about is if somebody makes a statement, the impetus is not on you to prove they're wrong. The impetus is on them to prove they are right. Now, what that means is if you're going to say, well, Sally Hemings was raped by Jefferson and Jefferson did all these terrible things. Okay, well, if that's your position, then you have to defend that position and prove you're right. And so what we tell the kids is the first question we all ought to ask anytime anybody says anything, well, how do we know? Right? So if we're going to say, well, we know Jefferson did this, how do we know he did that? Because there are people that make that accusation today, but even the idea that Jefferson fathered children with Sally Hemings isn't substantiated with historical fact or evidence because they will they say, well, there was a DNA test that was done. The DNA test didn't even use Thomas Jefferson's See, DNA. See, here's the thing. In, in November of 1998 is when a, a, a test came out. Uh, Eugene Foster, DNA scientist who did the test, it was announced by Joseph Ellis, a historian at Holyoke University, and he said, we now know it. DNA now proves that Thomas Jefferson fathered the children of Sally Hemings. She had five children from, from Thomas to Eston through Madison. Through there were, there were five kids. We now know it. And, and so in that next two weeks, 211 news outlets carried the story Jefferson fathered Hemings' children. This was in what? In, in November of 1998. Nature and Science magazine ran the lead on it. And, and so that's how it came to be. Nobody paid attention to the fact that two weeks, six weeks later, a retraction came out and said, well, uh, we're actually pulling that story back because it turns out Jefferson really, that's not what the DNA evidence proved because we didn't use Jefferson's DNA. Wait a minute, you're just now saying you didn't use Jefferson's DNA? It you sounds just like him. Brett Kavanaugh's confirmation it, here. It, it was, a little bit. It, it was does. crazy stuff. So what happened is only 11 sources we found ever carried the retraction. So people think it's out there. What happened after that? Now, we know how to, okay, I, there's a book I have called The Jefferson Lies, which goes into all this evidence and stuff that's there. And it's the kind of thing where if you went into court of law, you'd want to see the evidence on both sides, see what's there. So after this came out, it, uh, there was 15 universities that sent talk ap academics to, to check and see what the, f the evidence was. And so it was from Harvard, it's from Yale, it's from Indiana University, Kentucky University. These 15 profs came in saying, we think Jefferson did it. And they all came out unanimous saying, there's no evidence he did it. There's none at all that he did it. And so we actually talked to Eugene Foster, who did a second set of testing on it. And Eugene Foster, is, see what got this started was a political hack in 1804 was ticked at Thomas Jefferson because Jefferson wouldn't appoint him to office. And so he said, I'm going to make you pay for that. And he said, Thomas Jefferson slept with Sally Hemings. Her first son is named Thomas. And that proves that it was father by Jefferson. So Eugene Foster tested the descendants of, of Thomas Hemings, the, the first son, found no Jefferson DNA anywhere in the whole line. And that's the one that got it started. And there's the one the, named Thomas. Now they found that in the, the, in the fourth child, Eston, there was some Jefferson DNA in there, but there were 26 Jefferson males in Monticello and they don't know which it was. And the historical evidence back then always said it was Jefferson's brother who fathered that child, not Thomas Jefferson. So Eugene Foster went back and did a second set of DNA testing, came back with the same results. He said, I told, I, I told Ellis when he wrote that piece that he overstated it because that's not what the DNA evidence showed. So to this day, you still get this stuff of Jefferson did it. How about some evidence? Yeah, and, and, and to be accurate, the DNA did not clear him either, but it didn't incriminate him. So, right, part of the due process in America is you need evidence before you can just believe. I mean, you mentioned the Kavanaugh hearings, right? Before we believe all these accusations, let's have some proof somewhere. And for many of these things, there's been no proof. People say, well, yeah, but at Monticello, they still to this day say that. Well, it's true. A lot of people say that today. But when we start looking for proof, right, well, how do we know? What, what's your source? Where did you get your information? There's not actually evidence for that. Well, I've also heard people say that uh, Jefferson uh, freed all of Sally's children uh, later, I guess, at she death were, or something like that. She was partially and, black, and he was able to free some because, again, Virginia law did not allow him to free slaves. So he was. Now able, this is even after the revolution. Oh, Correct. long after the revolution. Long. I mean, you're going. You're going till the the Thirteenth Amendment, 1865, before you start getting slaves freed in Virginia. Matter of fact, really? one of the stories we're going to tell about the American Revolution is what great effort it took to free one hero of the American Revolution who is black from Virginia. You could be anti. Do you know a lot of people who were anti-slave in Virginia, like Jefferson was? They said, "We're just moving to another state so we can free our slaves," and they did. 
And so there were a lot that did the, the guy, that which was Jeff, not easy to do at that time. And, and Jefferson, right, without automobiles, up, no, you know, he couldn't pick up all all his family holdings for the years they've had them. And, and am I also out. correct that he had a lot of financial problems, and he was basically, in a sense, trapped. He had to have slaves. He, he had to because the law in Virginia said if you're in debt, you cannot sell a single slave because we may have to take those slaves to pay off your debt. He was 2.5 million debt in their money. That's a lot of money right. back in their days. He inherited a huge debt from his wife's husband, uh, and Jefferson invested a lot of money to help America win independence. Inflation hit. He only got back 3% of what he invested, uh, so he lost a ton of money in funding the revolution. Nonetheless, Jefferson was massive in debt when he died. That's why he sold his library to the Library of mm -hmm. Congress to try to raise money to get some operating funds. So he's not even allowed to free his slaves no matter how badly he wants to. And, and so he just was not able to do so. And so he was able to free some of Sally's children because they they were so, they were not, they she was mulatto several times. And so there was enough diminu diminution of, of blood in there. They said, well, not enough black blood, whatever well, that I is. Well, I heard that she was three-fourths white and one-fourth black. Is that and correct? And her children, her children would, would be even less yes. that. And so, you know, at that point, I think the law was one eighth. And am I eighth. also correct? I heard this someplace that she was actually the half sister of Jefferson's wife. Is that um, correct? That's heard. I've never seen evidence of that. Right. Okay. Maybe well, there. We I've won't never seen evidence. That, but I'd heard that. Too. Yeah. Well, and this is one of the things that so often what we hear are are negative things about America. And I mean, let me even back up. Right. We were talking about there's there's so many black heroes. So let me back up to the Second Great Awakening. I'm sorry, I got you guys way <laughs> oh, off it's track. Right. No, but but, but this it, is the questions that people are asking. You're asking. And questions. That's I'm, I'm asking questions that I know people are out here because they've just swallowed they this hook, line, and singer. So. Yeah. Well, because we we don't know to look for truth, and and if if a professor tells us, well, they probably know what they're talking about, is what we assume, even though a lot of times they don't have evidence. So Harry Hoosier is a really fun example of the influence of black Americans and a lot of their contribution. He was a minister in the Second Great Awakening. So he mentioned, grew up, um, learned, actually as a slave, when he was finally freed, he could not read or write. And he, as a Christian though, he wanted to learn more and he would have people read him the Bible. As they read him the Bible, he would just listen and memorize what they heard him read. Well, there was a Methodist minister coming through, Francis Asbury, who is a significant leader in the Second Great Awakening. Francis Asbury then becomes kind of a mentor for Harry Hoosier. And, and can I say about Asbury that Francis Asbury is actually considered a founding father by many historians mm -hmm. because he spent 40 years, you would love this, you and I have cowboy background. He spent 40 years on horseback, preaching the gospel from horseback, rode 140,000 miles on horseback. That's 140,000 miles on horse. So he's he's got kind of like George Whitfield. He was all over everything, getting people to think right and getting them looking right. So they get they get connected. So he gets Harry Hoosier to travel with him. Francis Ashbury says, I I'm going to be over here. I'm going to talk to the white crowds. You gather the, the, the slaves and the free blacks and you talk to them because everybody needs the gospel. Well, this seems like an acceptable idea based on the time frame they're in. That's just kind of how it was. Except Francis Asbury would speak and then Harry Hoosier would speak. And Harry Hoosier, when he began speaking, he was so good that the white crowds would come and join his rally crusade kind of things. And Francis Asbury said that Harry Hoosier started drawing larger crowds than he would mm -hmm. because the white people wanted to join with the black crowds to hear Harry Hoosier talk. Uh, Benjamin so Rush. That's, that's part of that revival thing where revival helped bring that equality thing together. It helped break down a lot of the walls. And Hoosier is one of those Which examples. the gospel should unite us. That's right. right? Absolutely. Because in Christ, there's no Greek or Jew or Scythian or slave or free. We're all one in Christ. And that's what it should do. It's what it did at times in American history. And so he decides at this point, Francis Asbury is continuing on and he decides, I, I want to go and reach people who haven't heard the gospel. So he goes out west and out west at the time was the Indiana Territory. He gets to Indiana, and Indiana, if for those listening, maybe you know, Indiana is named the Hoosier State. Well, this Wait is minute, Harry what, what's his name? Hoosier, right? <laughs> Harry Hoosier. So is there a connection? He traveled all over the state of Indiana evangelizing, and, and almost like if you remember from the book of Acts, where when Christians were first called Christians, it wasn't a compliment necessarily. It was like, oh, you're one of those Christians that was how the Hoosier name came to be because some of these converts on the wild western frontier now were different people. You're talking mountain men and the guys that went to the rendezvous and all the trappers and traders and all the rough guys. And their friends look at them and go, 
what the heck happened to him? Oh, he's one of those Hoosiers. So been Hoosierized. He's been yeah. Hoosierized. <laughs> well, his influence was so great that that he is credited with the Indiana Territory gaining the name the Hoosiers after Harry Hoosier. The Hoosier wow. State. Now, I wonder how many people in Indiana know they've been named after a black evangelist. How about that? Now, that's slightly amount. That, that, that's now, sli- that's some American history See, during that, Black History Month that we That is a huge on. impact. How many other states are named for an individual and try to find him in a history book? Well, today. and if we start going through the history, right, you have people like Absalom Jones, who was another minister in, in kind of the founding father period. He, along with Reverend Richard Allen, both worked for the A. Me, uh, help and do that denomination. Yeah, he's the first black bishop in America in the Anglican denomination or the Episcopal denomination. These two guys worked real closely with Dr. Benjamin Rush, who was the, the leader of the abolition movement. He trained them in medicine. And when the yellow fever epidemic in 1793 hit Philadelphia, all the physicians ran except for these guys. And, and they were, in addition to treating hundreds of people, they were burying, they said they were burying 120 bodies a day as a result of that plague. And so the, the, the book that he wrote on the yellow fever epidemic, talking about he and Rush and Absalom Jones, and, it is a heroic book. It's just a, a terrific stuff, but we just don't know who, who these guys are today. Well, and, and even, Can people find books? Is yes, this yes. Those books are online, so, Google Books. You can download it, yeah. read it, PDF. It's so easy. again, tell them how to do that. Well, and, and Andrew, even to the point of your question, we would encourage that nobody should just take our word for this, right? Be the Bereans. Say, I'm going to look this up and make sure. And the thing is, all of this information is out there. It's just not really taught, which is why we have such a false perception sometimes. Let's go to John Morant for a minute. Take, but take I John. bet you with the internet now, you could probably put these names in. And oh, yeah. yes, you can. Uh, you can do not... a basic Google search and you can find information on all of these guys online, every single one of them and the many more we're coming to. Yeah, one of my favorite stories. Let me have this book right here, Tim. This is written by this guy right here, John Morant. Now, John Morant grew up in New York. They moved to Georgia, then they moved to South Carolina. He is a free black. When he was 12 years old in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, it's time to get a trade. You've been to school long enough, you know, get get a job. And so his parents wanted, his mother actually wanted him to, to get in a trade. He said, I want to be a musician. She said, you're crazy. That doesn't make any money. I want to be a musician. Well, he talked her into it. So he actually ends up becoming a child prodigy with both the French horn and the violin. And so he started getting asked to play for all sorts of private parties. And he is raking in the money. I mean, she said, we don't ever need another job. You're making so much, you'll take care of all of us. So he's 12 what years old. What was the time frame? This, this happened, he was born in 1734, I think. So this is in the 40s. This would be the 40s and 50s, 1740s and 50s. So he, he was on his way to play a, because he was just so good as a musician. He was on his way to play one of these private events. And he and a friend were on the way to that event, and they passed by a meeting house, which is a church. And as they passed by, his friend bumped him and said, listen to that, that crazy guy hallooing in there. And so John said, well, let's go see what it is. And the other friend said, no way. He said, yeah, let's go see. He said, the only way I'll go in there with you is if you take your horn out and you go in there and you blow your horn and break up the meeting, I'll go in there with you. So they got inside, and, and this, is, this is John Morant's own narrative. This is his own book. This is his testimony. I'm getting, and this thing was one of the most famous books in America back then. It went through reprint after reprint after reprint after reprint. It's considered one of the, the three most significant black narratives in American history. And so he's telling the story, and he said that when they got inside, he looked up, and the guy who was the crazy guy, Halloween, was a guy named George Whitfield. Well, he, he walked into a Whitfield revival in First Great Awakening, and he said when he walked in, got his horn out, he was kind of pushing people away, getting ready to blow the horn. He said that Whitfield whirled and pointed at him and said, prepare to meet thy God. And when he said that, he said he fell to the floor. He said, I fell to the floor both senseless and speechless. He was just frozen, paralyzed. And people tried to come. They helped get him up. They get him up and he fall down. Get him up and fall down. They use smelling salts. And, and, and Woodfield's just preaching away. He's still preaching up there. And, and so at the end of the service, he's just limp as a rag. They can't get him revived. And so Whitfield comes back to him and looks at him laying on the ground and says, Well, the Lord Jesus has got thee at last. And so Whitfield says, I wish I had time to spend with you. I'm going to another meeting. I'll have one of my friends come see you and talk to you. So they took him home. They carried him home because he couldn't walk. They put him in bed. He couldn't get out of bed. He was limp as a dish rag. And for three days, he's like that. They have to feed him. They get the doctor over. The doctor tries stuff. It won't work. And, and so this, this preacher friend comes in and says, can I pray with you? 
<laughs> and John says, I, I ran away from him so fast on the bed, I fell off the other side of the bed. No, I don't want you praying for me. And he said, the preacher picked him up, brought him back on the red, bed, held his hands and prayed for him, said, how do you feel? I feel terrible. Let's pray again. How do you feel? I feel terrible. Third time, how do you feel? I feel like something's going on. And so, he's, and so it ends up he gets converted to Christ, and I mean a passionate conversion. So he goes and starts sharing the gospel with his family, and they said, you're crazy. Get out of the house. We don't want you in this family anymore. So he's now 13 years old. He's been kicked out of the home. He is depressed. He's just constantly doesn't have a home. And he starts wandering around the woods, and a Cherokee Indian brave finds him. What are you doing? And they talk. He says, well, just live out here with me. I'm hunting. So for the next 10 weeks, they stayed in the woods together. They hunted together. And at the end of 10 weeks, the brave says, it's time for me to go back to my village. You don't have anywhere to go. Why don't you go with me? And John said, if I go to your Cherokee village, they'll know I'm not Cherokee. I'm obviously <laughs> black. And this isn't. And, and the Cherokee brave said, I'll speak for you. It'll be all right. And so when they walked in the village, John, they instantly recognized him. And the chief said, you're not Cherokee. Kill that man. And the brave tried to speak, and the chief wouldn't let him. And so John calls him the king of the tribe. And so they took him to a trial, and in the trial, the judge convicted him and sentenced him to death. The executioner said, here's how we're going to kill you, a very barbaric death. It's all described in there. And so then, then they put him in a separate hut to await his execution. He had his Bible with him. He carried it with him everywhere. While he was in the hut, he was just rejoicing. He's going to go see Jesus. This is going to be so cool. He gets to see Jesus now because he's going to be executed. And he's just praying away and praising. And the executioner standing outside hearing this. And the executioner burst in and said, who are you talking to? Well, I'm talking to Jesus. Where's Jesus? Well, he's here with me. I don't see him. And goes back and forth. And so he tells him that the executioner gets converted, becomes a Christian. <laughs> Praise the God. executioner then takes him to the judge and said, this guy is not what we think. And the judge gets converted. Wow. They take him to the king. And when he gets to the king, the king has a 17-year-old daughter. She sees the book that John's got. And she goes and takes it. And she starts kissing the book. And John gets the book back and starts sharing the gospel with the chief. And then the daughter grabs the book again, holds it to her ear and just holds it. And so the king says, you've got my daughter under a spell. You break that spell or I'll chop you to pieces right here in front of me. And the king ends up getting converted. And so now the whole leadership of the tribe, 13-year-old kid, the whole wow. leadership's converted. He says, you know, there's a whole lot of my brethren that need to hear the message you've got. And so what he did was he took 50 of his braves, and for the next two years, they traveled from Indian village to Indian village to Indian village. He shared the gospel. He is the first black American successfully to evangelize Native Americans. The British captured him and pressed him and made him fight on the British side in the revolution. After the revolution, he comes back and has these massive churches, successful church. The guy is unbelievable. And this account is online, and it does say at the bottom, an account of the conversion of the king of the Cherokees and his daughter. But this is part of the history. So of the name again is John Morant. John, John Morant. Morant. John Morant. Morant. Yeah. One of the cool stories. In, in, that in, is awesome, man. If you've watched all of today's program, I know that you were blessed, and I want to encourage you. To, you need to not only get this; you need to get this so that you can go over it yourself, but so that you can share it with other people. We have six weeks worth of television broadcasts. The two that I'm doing here during Black History Month 2020, but also. We have uh, teachings that I interviewed David back in 2009 and also 2013. And so six weeks worth of interview with David Barton, and this would be a blessing to you. We've also got information about how you can go directly to their website at Wall Builders, and it would be a blessing. You need this not only for yourself, but for other people. Listen to our announcer and please call or write today. Today you saw a portion of Andrew's interview discussing Black History Month and the role black Americans have played in America's history. This entire interview is available as part of the God and Country album, which also includes previous interviews with David Barton discussing America's godly heritage. God and Country is available in either a CD or DVD album made from our daily television broadcast. Each of these valuable resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. You can become a Grace Partner or order resources through our website at awmi.net. While there, you can discover more product details and download additional free resources. 
or call our helpline Monday through Friday from 4.30 a.m. to 9.30 p.m. Mountain Time at 719-635-1111. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. All persons suspected of following the religious sect, known as Christianity, will be thrown to the lions! an accredited Bible college in the beautiful town of Woodland Park has been changing people's lives for over 25 years. The people here are so like-minded. They want to help you grow. These are people who genuinely care about you. They want the best for you. Be prepared to be blown away with the teachings. It's not just a season in your life. There's no way you can't change. You can't really go wrong going to a place that you get to sit and listen to the Word for four hours a day. Being under the Word that much just allowed God to pour so much into me. If you feel supernatural peace about coming to Karis, that's God. I know you're like, how, when, where, all these questions, just do it. The Lord will provide. I was doubting and second guessing it, but when I took that step of faith, immediately like things were provided. Just being around like-minded believers, teachers who are there for you and ready to talk to you at any moment and answer your questions, there's just nothing like it. Just follow the leading of the one that you serve, and that's always going to be the right direction to go. Go to charisbiblecollege.org to register today. Many of you are aware that we have a Karis Bible College worldwide, but our headquarters is located in Woodland Park, Colorado, and God has really blessed us. We have seen God provide supernaturally, and we now have somewhere around uh, close to $95 million worth of facilities at our main campus. But we owe about $23 million on a parking garage and in order to get this paid off so that we can continue with student housing and all of the other things that are necessary for this Bible college, I've started what I call a 1K club. I was praying about this and the Lord just spoke to me that He was going to be touching people's hearts that can give a one-time gift of $1,000 or people that can pledge for $100 a month for 10 months. And in the next 10 months, I'm believing to get this parking garage totally paid off. I'd like to ask you to pray about it. And if the Lord speaks with you, join with us, become a part of this 1K Club. We've got a great feature. If you aren't watching at the time your favorite program comes on, you can go back and get whatever you want to see on demand. It's a great feature. Check it out at gospeltruth.tv.